So could we please have you state your full name and how long you've been at RIT? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Marsha Schnaka Traurnick, and I've been at RIT since January 6th, 1986. Thank you. So today is February, April 19th, and it is 2.09 p.m. I am Sophie Tomla. Um, I'm the RIT Archives Oral History Program Student Assistant, and I am here with Marsha, the Director of RIT Libraries. Marsha has just announced her retirement from RIT for this summer, and my supervisor, Landon Hatch, who is the Marie Golisano Graham Outreach Archivist, is also present and may chime in from time to time. Before we get started, may I have your verbal consent to record this interview? Yes. Thank and that's you. as formal as we'll get. Um, <laughs> from here on out, it's more conversational. Yes. No, it's just protocol. Yes. Yes. So would you mind telling us about yourself, where you're from, how you grew up? Uh, sure. I'm originally from the state of Illinois. Um, I grew up in on a farm uh, in kind of rural central Illinois. Probably the closest city people might recognize would be Springfield, the capital, which was about an hour's drive away. And I went to a very small high school. Uh, we had one of the biggest graduating classes, which was 50 people. So <laughs> exciting times. And the school, like everything else, was near a cornfield. Um, I felt an affinity to go into the music field. And uh, I ended up going to a local um, four-year liberal arts college, McMurray College, in nearby Jacksonville, Illinois. Um, and got a degree, a bachelor's of music degree uh, in music education. And with an emphasis in band, so that meant learning the basics of how to play all the instruments and, and teach on them and so forth. Um, and then, you know, I had a year off or so. It's like, okay, what do I want to do next? Because I found I really didn't want to teach in the public school system. It's like, okay, did a practicum. Eh, not for me. Um, so then um, I went and got a full assistantship at Western Illinois and Macomb, Illinois, which is kind of in the central west part of the state. And it was a brand new degree called um, a master's in piano pedagogy, which is basically how to teach piano. And so I was there for two years um, and taught both um, individual students and class classes on electric pianos and um, then just and gave a graduate recital and did qualifying exams and all that good stuff and then off for another year or two because setting up your own studio or even working in somebody else's studio would be a number of years where you're working with any students that come your way and I had already had an experience you know, if a student really wants to be there and learn piano, it's great. If their mom is making them, not so great. And when you start out, there's a lot of my mom is making me students. So I'm like, I really don't want to do that. So I did um, a stint part-time as a church organist for a few years and um, uh, freelancing as a piano accompanist and then decided, let's go to library school. So then I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, got my MLS, and um, a few years after that, um, found a temp job at the library here. And part of the story, I had met my future husband at U of I, and he is a physicist, and he um, got a position as a research scientist at Eastman Kodak. And so he moved out here first, and so I was not having a lot of luck or always being like second best for job applications. You know, somebody else would always beat me out. Okay. And so he saw this ad in the local paper for a temporary position for a cataloger. So I applied, came out on People's Express, um, and um, interviewed, and then subsequently got the position. And of course, the first question was, how did you find out from this, about, this, about this job? Because it was just posted locally. So that was the story. And then it turns out I was the only one who applied. So anyway, the position was to catalog the backlog of books. And 
after close to five months, you know, I was here for a six months appointment. Uh, one of the other full-time catalogers took a job elsewhere. So I applied for that job and got it and became the cataloger of all the science or all the STEM books and photography. So that's where I learned a lot about the subject matters taught at RIT, at least for part of the programs. And as the years went on, I became department head of that department and then added um, like the digitization lab, um, digital scholarship services, you know, and kind of grew um, the purpose of the library beyond just traditional cataloging. And uh, also did some stints. For a few years I also supervised the serials department and then a stint is kind of looking for grants and so forth for the director at the time. And in 2016 the previous director was going to retire at the end of June. So a search committee was established but it was just an internal search committee where uh, just two of us from the library were on the search and everybody else was not. And that search failed and so I was asked to be interim for a few months. I'm like, okay, sure. And then later on, whether it was just easier to ask me, do you want to just stay and be permanent director? Or whether it was like, oh, I don't want to bother with another search again. But anyway, I thought about it, I accepted. And there were certain areas where, you know, these are not my strengths, but okay. So the first year was just getting used to my role of supervising my peer managers, which is always interesting, but worked out okay. And then kind of starting to learn the ropes of additional administrative duties. And then there was, um, in the fall, near the end of fall uh, 2017, um, my immediate supervisor left RIT, which was kind of a shock to people. And then, okay, I'm reporting to the provost, which is good for the library. And then shortly after that, he announced he was leaving <laughs> at the end of the semester to take another job, uh, I think at the University of Denver in Colorado. Okay, so it was just this constant um, turnover of higher leadership that directly affected me in the library that was a little um, unsettling and of course the ongoing data preparation and everything for the shed and the Wallace renovation kept happening and then COVID. So of course like everybody else it was just doing the best you can and then when we came back campus, dealing with all the safety protocols that were in place, you know, reducing the seating in the library to less than a third of what it was just to keep distances, having spray bottles of sanitation fluid <laughs> all over the place that people didn't use as much as they should have, um, and then just getting used to trying to do our services and keep both uh, the RIT community and the library staff safe. Um, so, you know, finally got over that and then the building project reality hit. We found out exactly how the library would be renovated and initially we were going to move both the archives and the carry collection off-site down the road to Jefferson in a very large facility that if it was rehabbed would be wonderful. You know, the only con to that would be that it's away from campus as far as students and people coming there. So everybody in those departments was excited. And then I think they found that would be rather costly. And so at the last minute they said, eh, you guys are going over to Ritter uh, Arena. And we're like, okay. So we had to prepare collections for that, figure out first move a number of books and things to offsite storage over in Building 99 on the edge of campus. And then figure out how to fit everything else in Ritter plus what services needed to be permanently located there versus who could work remotely, who needed to stay in the building in some manner. So for the next couple years, uh, it was just having staff all over the place and just dealing with 
the oddities of being in an ice arena in the middle of the athletics department and the entrance that students preferred to use to go in and out of the locker rooms took them through the Ritter Library any time of day and night. And so, you know, all that was just getting used to it. But it worked out well. Um, a lot of students really liked having what they believed were all the books and everything all in one place. It was easy to find stuff. It wasn't on different floors and, and all that. Uh, the only thing we just didn't have near the study space uh, that would have been appreciated. But it worked. And we got a little publicity out of the whole novelty of being in the ice arena. So this past summer, the plans, okay, we're moving back. And um, I'm not going to address the two years of being in the building with construction. But I will say, working with Mark Phillips, who was the project leader for the shed in the library um, from FMS, and with the construction company, Welliver, was delightful. They were very considerate of all the staff, very helpful, kind of going out of their way to do things for us. Uh, it was great as far as dealing with a company. I was here when we built the 1990-91 edition to the library. Very different flavor of construction company. So this was a, a big improvement. So we moved everything back and of course a lot of things weren't finished. Um, but we were open and then starting to learn to work with our buddies in the shed and, and all this stuff. And so now we've lived almost to the end of an academic year, so I think we have a better feel for how the flow of people in and out, which is too much, but <laughs> uh, and then just how spaces are really being used, particularly by students, and trying to address some of the needs that weren't addressed by the project, like why weren't more outlets put everywhere? Um, is a big one students keep asking. Um, and then just getting used to having to manage the access to the classrooms when there are no classes, a lot of requests come in for either student groups or other people on campus to book those rooms. And plus we were down a circulation staff members so we had to reduce our hours for a while and so it was interesting trying to make everything work as much as possible. But I think we came out okay. So I'm really pleased uh, that an outside search firm was used for the next university librarian and that the makeup of the search committee is great. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what the results of, of the, are of the upcoming um, interview sessions with three candidates and um, hoping somebody can start right after I leave. <laughs> So I'm going to back us up a little sure, bit. Sure. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could talk more about that transition from music to library school. Well, music had always been kind of my thing in junior high and high school. You know, I was in band and, and choir, um, and then I was accompanist for a lot of things in choir. And so I think part of it was, you know, I was drawn to it, and then also kind of my identity at the time. And then, you know, I had met somebody that went to that small college not far away in, in the music program. It's like, oh, you have to come here. And so I was kind of set on going there. Okay. And then went through, you know, the first three years fine. You know, had a good group. And, you know, it was a small enough campus that you really got to know everybody or at least about everybody. And then, you know, the final year where reality hits, okay, final recital, student teaching, oh, what are you going to do next? And just finding out, well, teaching in a public schools or, you know, a grades K through 12, you know, especially from eighth grade on, I'm like, mm, that's not for me. And so, as I mentioned, you know, I did um, a little freelancing accompanists off and on, then went to master's in piano ped pedagogy, um, and then decided, okay, this maybe isn't the right fit for me. And then <clears throat> thinking, well, library school, and of course the thing, oh, I love to read, and you know, all that good stuff. 
<coughs> and even at the time, and we're talking in the mid 80s or 1980s, um, the Library School at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign has always been one of the top ones. And I felt, I have. I am really proud that all this time since I've been there, they continue to be number one in the nation. Whether or not that's reflected in me is another story. Um, and so I decided I'm here, I'm paying for this, and I'm going to take everything and anything so I can get, I'm prepared for any type of library job. and. So some interesting courses and worked really hard. I had a part-time job in the technical services area of the main library, searching a bibliographic database for MARC records to download into the online catalog there. So that was great experience, just practical work experience. And I was also a graduate um, student working with Don Crummel, who was the professor in charge of music libraries, bibliographies, and so forth. Um, so that was fun to work for him also, since I was interested in music librarianship. Uh, so there, you know, I felt, you know, I was really learning things. And of course, at the time, you know, okay, I've also taken classes in children's lit and youth and, and all this stuff, so I'm okay to go anywhere. And of course, you know, at the time, there was kind of a slowdown in hiring library librarians in general, no matter what type of library. And I would always make it to the second round, but not called in. Okay. And so by that time I had met my husband, we decided, you know, we keep this relationship going. He moved out to Rochester, found this temp job, and that's how I kind of evolved to working here. So I don't know if that answers your question a bit more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what were your own? What were your first impressions of RIT? I had never heard of it before. You know, it just wasn't a name you heard out in the Midwest. Okay. And I'm like, fine, you know, I don't care, you know. So I really didn't know much about it. And when I go here, the campus was much, much smaller. And you couldn't even drive around the whole campus. You could only enter and park at the front. There was no road back here. And certainly fewer buildings. And I don't know, you know, the library culture was a little different too. Uh, there was a definite kind of upstairs, downstairs feel where um, the librarians in the reference department, you know, were the ones that worked mostly with faculty and students, of course. But I think part of it was the department head at the time kind of cultivated this kind of upper tier and everybody else who worked at, sec, uh, at circulation or downstairs, well, like when a, a new librarian came and the head of reference comes by to introduce her, goes, this is your cataloger. Okay, I guess I can say my name, I don't know. It, yeah, so it was just this kind of division, you know, like, you know, the, the popular PBS TV show upstairs, downstairs kind of thing. But that has certainly evolved over the years, and we're finding how all the jobs in the libraries are so much more interconnected than possibly they were in the past. And I think people understand that, that work here now. So the culture is much, much better, I think. So you were mentioning that you're a cataloger. Um, and that's what you came here to do first. Would you mind going through what a typical day would look like for you in that position? Uh, sure. It, I mean, it started out when I started here, everything was still print. There were barely any online catalogs and no databases in any format. It was just a few that were totally online. They were so costly, like the librarian, if somebody had a research request. They would interview the person, determine what keywords, and then do the search themselves for articles because it was so expensive. You couldn't just let anybody go in there and tootle around. Um, so a typical day for me uh, was um, a number of books. When I came here, there was a decent backlog, which meant that uh, good copy wasn't available the first time. Um, a book was searched in um, a database that contained records from a number of libraries that you could use and edit. 
Um, so they were put back on the shelf and then like once a month or whatever the schedule was be researched by somebody um, and then after maybe three three months okay it this had to go to one of the professional catalogers to create original record to input into that system um, so I would work and I had I think one hour a day to use the one machine that was dedicated to this big database of records um, with six other people so sometimes it got nasty if somebody went over their time <laughs> it really did um, and then print out records and then go back edit them um, look at the Library of Congress subject headings uh, controlled vocabulary that's used in almost all American libraries especially academic ones Library of Congress classification schedules and then you know if it was a topic I've never done before you know some additional reading and research which took more time that time but that would prepare me uh, for subsequent materials on the same topic so I learned a lot about polymids and polymers and everything like that because that was a big thing over at the College of Science at the time uh, art photography which I really enjoyed and then lasers were a big deal back then so you know, and then, you know, topics in any other STEM uh, discipline. And what happened then, all these records would be loaded um, or edited records would be in that big database of records. And then the head cataloger would go at the end of Fridays, um, check to make sure all the names of authors and everything were formatted correctly and then push a button and all of the work that was done that week would be sent to that company which would put it on a magnetic tape. The tape would be mailed over the weekend arriving here on Monday and our systems department person, which is one person, would go and load the tape into the online catalog we had. Then we had one staff member that would go and all the books were barcoded and labeled and once that tape was loaded, she would go back in and add an item record and scan in the barcode and type in the call number so it could be checked out. Then they were sent upstairs to the circulation department to shelf. So now everything is much more automatic. There, there are no magnetic tapes. It's all, you know, virtual and so forth. Um, so that's changed dramatically. And then there's been improvements in using different programs from some of our vendors that... Um, automatically search records that were ordered and retrieved records uh, so there wasn't an additional search in that parent database to find records it was done automatically from when an order record was in, in place and of course now we get thousands of ebooks either individually or in packages and so we work with batches of records we download them from whatever source uh, we add some local content and then we download those in our catalog and that also means whenever a title is pulled by a vendor um, then we have to go in and make sure those records are deleted and, and so forth so there are fewer and fewer print materials cataloged or DVDs more of it's streaming but there's still a lot of intensive work in making these materials accessible in our catalog and in our discovery layer it's just the format of the information has changed. And of course, we still do, do work uh, for the carry collection for cataloging the materials, and off and on a little work for archives. All right, You're, you mentioned that you started using different programs and servers during your time here. Do you have any memories of any, of starting these particular programs and like transitioning from analog to digital? cataloging. I know that I came across some articles about microfish. Oh. Microfishing. Uh, the format that nobody likes. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I first came here, we barely had a very ru rudimentary online catalog system that people could search, you know, the public could search, and also back-end functions mm -hmm. for, you know, tech services and, you know, acquisitions, cataloging, and then circulation. And um, the backup, in case the catalog went down, which it did once in a while, was microfiche. Once a year, our holdings, because we still had those tapes, um, 
were converted into microfilm. And so, you know, if people wanted to look at that or a librarian needed to look at something up, they just grabbed whatever packet of fish that was relevant, went over to a fish reader, and we had a bunch, and look that up, magnify it, and write down the information. Um, and of course, as our catalog systems improved and we went to different platforms of catalog systems, everything became easier and more relevant. And of course, as materials changed formats and moved more into electronic field, uh, more functionalities were added to ingest those and manipulate those records also. So it's been kind of a smooth transition once we um, were able to have a much improved catalog system from when I started. So it really wasn't a huge ordeal. Um, just you had to learn new rules that were being developed by um, the cataloging sections of the American Library Association and uh, the MARC format, which was developed in the late 60s but had to be updated to accommodate all these electronic variations. And um, also, just all our cataloging tools, we used to have reams of paper, like the LC classification schedules that you had to buy a new set every once in a while, all online now. Have to pay for it yet, but. Um, so it wasn't like there was a huge learning curve. It was just mostly, oh, here's a new format, like, you know, moving from VHS tapes to DVDs different encoding, different descriptions. But, you know, I would write procedures for that, know the rules, and set that up for the catalog. So it was just really more of a gradual process in accommodating new formats of information. Got it. What was your favorite part of being a cataloger? Um, I think as far as the materials I worked with was the artistic photograph books. I really got to learn the collection and, you know, famous photographers photographers and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I will tell a tell. We had an acquisitions person, of course, who would receive all the books. And, of course, nudity is a big topic, sometimes for photography. And most of the time it's tasteful, you know. But anyway, that's why they were bought. So this person, once she received it and said, yeah, we receive it, we'll pay for it, was sent it to cataloging with these little notes lots of nudity on pages 30 and 35 or you know all this stuff this should go to archives <laughs> and so this was still the time when the web wasn't around and so we did have this problem with people razoring out things in books whether it was for naughty pictures or information in general so we had a big book repair business downstairs and once in a while it was so bad they just would have to order another book um, but once people had access to the World Wide Web, that really died down. And so it's like, we don't really keep, need to keep all these photography books and archives anymore. You know, especially they were just there mostly for that reason. So they were freed from storage and out in the collections now. So that was a little side thing. Um, but, you know, it was just learning the subject matters because people think, from the outside, even in the library field, that doing cataloging type of work, whether you call it just traditional cataloging or metadata work, it's the same thing, um, is just, oh, you download a record and you don't do much of it, you just pop it in the catalog. A lot of, there are some categories of records that they're fine, they're from the Library of Congress, that's fine. But a lot of them, especially if you do original cataloging, you have to research, you really have to look at the item. You have to go to other sources to get more context. So you're really doing research and then bringing that back into a very concise format um, to be a record that enables people to know what an item is about and how they can get a hold of it. So it's kind of all the code books, it's almost like being a lawyer in a way because you have all these different rules to follow for different parts of a record but yet being able to make something usable and sometimes very creative um, is something a lot of people don't understand. And for about 12 years, I taught um, uh, intro to cataloging or recorded information for the library school at the University of Buffalo. And for at least the first 
two-thirds of that students I most of them were amazed at how interesting cataloging was you know and a few of them like if I could I really like to go into it but for other reasons they went into other library fields uh, so that was kind of rewarding too that there's more to it than just searching a database and pushing a button uh, you mentioned briefly at the beginning how the Wallace Library and the library department in general has gone through many renovations. How do you feel like those renovations were beneficial to your department? For cataloging or the library as a whole? Either. Okay. Um, well, the first one I was really present for was the wraparound edition on the south and east sides that happened in the early 90s. And that was just to accommodate at the time um, the growth of the physical collection because that was still a thing at that time. And also years before this, um, RIT had bought Eisenhower College and their book collection, which tens of thousands of books were in storage. And a number of liberal arts professors, many of them had come from Eisenhower College and were employed here, uh, said, we need those books out. Of course, this is like 20 years since they've been bought. Um, so my summer project was to hire temps, and like the first year I was here, and working evenings and weekends, cataloging those books, getting them up in the system. Um, and so just adding 30 or 40,000 more books required a lot of space. And then just a, a little addition of additional room for growth and so forth. Um, so it didn't affect my department too much during construction except the one time they had a concrete saw and didn't tell anybody and started sawing through our outside wall, spraying chunks. And I said, I think we need to leave, you know. And they said, oh, we'll turn around. So it would spray on the outside, but then all the exhaust and smell and everything we're kind of we're just gonna leave um, but other than that uh, the outcome was we were kind of in an interior part in a very cramped room with like three or four students and six staff members and then carts and carts of books into the area that's a 500 now and so there was a lot more space to spread out and the cataloging department at the time had six people in it and we had the whole length of the south side from the building offices on it was cataloging and now it's the digitization lab and separate offices and, and all that um, so that was an improvement for us even though the staff were not happy because they didn't get new furniture or anything and that was true because it was all leftover stuff from the 50s and 60s and we we're like yeah, we didn't get it but there's new carpeting and, and windows so that was that um, and certainly more room for the stacks and the whole library was refurbished you know gussied up and so they had a big ceremony I think with the Board of Trustees and the Nathaniel Rochester Society at one point and so they made a big deal uh, out of the op you know an open house opening and the staff had to dress, be there and be stationed at different places throughout the library to help people get to wherever they need to go. And we had to wear black slacks or a black skirt and a white shirt. And so I remember the former head of acquisitions had bought new slacks. And then she was there using a staple and hemming them <laughs> right before we had to be on station because they were too long. So it was, it was funny. But um, that was the addition. And for this renovation, uh, quite different. Um, library staff were not able to be involved much at all in the initial construction of the design. Um, once um, the people from Ron, the main designer, came and started visiting, there was more incorporation of library staff input. And then um, library leadership and I met with Dr. Munson to talk about some things that were concerning to us, like where was archives. Um, and so he was able to find a bit more money to make things a little more 
useful for us, like putting the um, archives back on the third floor and some other things that accommodated us. Um, but yeah, I think people who never knew the previous version of Wallace think that this is fine unless they're taking a class upstairs and it's too hot or the whiteboards glare or you know that type of stuff but everything looks snappy and new and then you know certainly with the number of classes going on every day upstairs and then the traffic to and from the shed it's much much busier just with bodies uh, than it has in, been in the past. Um, concerns students have is like they really want a quiet places to study. They miss having the fourth floor as the quiet floor. And as I mentioned earlier, lack of power to plug in their devices. Um, and that it's, yeah, kind of crowded. But uh, We'll see how that evens out in the future. So I think having every, my staff and I having lived through the renovation, renovation we're kind of getting things settled. I think especially with the new university librarian coming on board, we're ready to go and really seek out and do new things, which we haven't really been able to do on a major scale because of leadership transitions, COVID, and then this building project. So you mentioned that there is a slight change in how the library is being used as a social space with the increased foot traffic of the shed. How have you seen the library as a space change throughout the years that you've been here and how students utilize it? Well, definitely there was always more seating throughout all four floors of Wallace. On the third and fourth floors, usually Around the perimeter, there were wooden carrels um, that kind of had a seat facing this way and a seat facing that way, and just all along the perimeters. A few study rooms, certainly not as many as there are now. Um, and then just two floors, or no, three floors of stacks. And that also helped muffle sound and so forth. And everything we had was in this building as far as resources. Um, we had fewer staff when I came here. Uh, for instance, the IT department just consisted of one person, and then a few years later, two, and now it's grown to seven, including the department head, which has been extremely valuable because we can get things done quickly. And also, we have so many unique needs as a library. Uh, it would take a long time for the general ITS staff A to probably get to us and then B, uh, really know the purpose and why things needed to be done a certain way and just the different natures of some of the materials we have. Um, and there was always foot traffic studying, um, you know, and of course the reference and the circulation desk had a lot of business. I used to work at the reference desk two hours a week. And you would always be with somebody else in the early years because you had anywhere from 30 to 40 questions an hour. Uh, they could be in-depth research or, you know, where's the restroom or, you know, where is this book type of thing. And the same thing with circulation, a lot more books were checked out then than, than now. And so there was just a lot of traffic for service desks. And then, you know, it was always kind of a place students could kind of wait between classes or, or whatever. I think things really picked up a big amount after the wraparound construction when Java Wally's, which was its original name, came into being. It was the first coffee house or coffee shop on campus and extremely popular because it didn't look like the rest of RIT. And you just have a, a little flavor of that when you go into the existing Javas. But besides the bar area, which is more or less the same size, you had an adjacent seating room with all sorts of funky furniture and art and color on the walls that is pretty much where ECC and the Writing Center are now. And I've heard now from especially faculty, that they really miss that. And, you know, it's really not the same, but 
they're still here. I like their coffee the best, so that worked out well. Um, and of course, with the 1991 um, edition, things were spiffed up, and you know it was a big deal to have more space. Yay! Uh, um, probably about, gosh, it might be getting on eight or nine years ago. The first floor was renovated. And that's uh, when all the reference books uh, that were print, and we still had print, uh, were integrated into the stacks. So no more stacks on the first floor. And this became a big seating area with tables and so forth. The aquarium was kind of on the other edge. And there'd be like shorter shelves that had like DVDs and stuff that kind of surrounded that. So it was open yet kind of enclosed. So that was a very popular place for students to study. Plus, we still had a computer lab out front on this floor. And I, it was kind of crowded with all the stuff, but I liked it because the center aisle, we could clear out the tables and everything, and we could have programs that maybe could seat 100 people. Or we had special events, we could rearrange things. So that's something I miss that we don't really have with the current setup now. Um, and so, yeah, that looked pretty nice. And then the whole end that used to, it started out as the Idea Factory, but the Writing Center was located on one end, and Radsey was located at the other end on the east side. And the middle was kind of a flex area. It had study tables and furniture, but if Radsey had a bigger program, they could expand out. If the Writing Center was doing more, they could expand out. But then, with the exception of the Radsey classroom, all the space was open in the evenings and weekends for studying or students to use. And then, of course, we could rearrange the furniture in the middle to have presentations or programs or whatever. So that was pretty handy. Um, so now with this, um, the classrooms have really condensed the footprint of the library. Like, there's nothing except artwork on the fourth floor that's the library. Okay. And most of the third floor are classrooms, but at least there's like the big center lounge area and then the exhibit area on the other side. So it adds a different flavor to that and kind of breaks up the classroom view. And then we have, you know, the quiet study rooms and stuff on the north side, plus then the archives. And so you're really getting down to the second floor and the first floor, which seems more like the traditional library that people expect. And so that's getting some used to a little bit for my staff. And even though 90% of what we buy or subscribe to for library resources is electronic, um, there's still a large collection mostly in art photography of books we buy every year because that's the nature of the resources for those disciplines. And so there's going to be this push and pull. Yeah, we're a real electronic library in many, or digital library in many senses. But because of the programs and colleges we have here, it's not like we can be totally electronic, like some schools that are pure tech schools. Um, and so there's this tension between those disciplines that like the print, or that's the only vehicle for that information, plus business and pretty much all the STEM colleges, that electronic access to the newest and greatest is what they're interested in. And so we're trying to be creative in having more programming and small events uh, to draw people in, to give them, you know, whether it's a social experience, some sort of educational experience, but yet doesn't require a huge time commitment. Uh, just to make especially the student experience a little more interesting. Uh, so that's kind of my focus. What do we do to get people in the building for us, not for coffee or for classes? So that's one thing I've been talking to the leadership team about. Um, so I think it'll still be a few years to get used to what the building is now for what the essence of the library should be and certainly to go out and about to the colleges and do more outreach there is something I've been emphasizing too. Some of the librarians do that quite rarely, some of the others not so much. Um, 
And then there's always a question, do you make forays to the dorm side of campus? That type of thing. And we do have a, a library here that focuses on student engagement. So I expect some good things there. So I don't know if that answered your question. It kind of rambled all over the place. No, but I think you answered that very well. From your vantage point, you know, what is, and now you said, you know, we're still settling, but what is the library's ideal role in the RET student experience? Well, part, part of that would be in the RIT, uh, an integral partner in the RIT educational experience. We're pushing and certainly making more strides in working with faculty on a regular basis to be consulted about the best way to do an assignment. Also, if there are special projects or you know long-term projects to be involved, and I certainly know that Archives and Carry have been involved with a number of faculty members in their classes to do a number of things um, that provide also experiential learning for the students in their field. Um, but I would certainly like to see more and more of that with all the colleges. And of course some, you know, like I've talked to the dean at um, GCCIS and I said, I just want to check with you because I know traditionally this college doesn't use the library much. And he goes, you know, especially for undergrads, and he goes, you know, that's really true because they're really makers, you know, coders, whatever. And, you know, part of it, they get their information from the professor or each other or GitHub or, you know, whatever. Um, and so it's really more of the master's students and stuff where the library would make more of an impact. But part of it is what can you do even if it's one-off things to engage those students. So that's a question I have uh, for my staff, you know. Um, but just in re realizing a lot of initial interest in the library really depends on the disciplines and then also if the faculty promote the library. So that's another thing, really getting to the faculty to make sure they know what the library can do not only for their students, but also for them. So we've been working in the last couple of years with researching, research computing, and we sent out an, a survey to faculty earlier this semester just to get documented all the different kinds of research needs and data storage or information storage that the researchers here at RIT need. So I have those results, and you know I'll have to pretty them up, and then it'll be the next librarian all right what we what do we do with this information what can the library do now and there certainly are some things and of course now they're looking for a new head of research computing so I'll be kind of starting all over with whoever's next there um, but there's so many areas where we can be involved because we're um, prepared to be and we have the expertise in certain areas that would enhance things um, especially with this big move to AI. And I provided one of my librarians' names to um, the committee because a call went out for, you know, something like that. And I said, you know, I said, is this restricted only to faculty? Because your message really just referred to faculty. Oh, no, this is for anybody. And I said, well, I have this step, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I love a librarian. I'm like, why does this have to be reminded of you to... Um, think about that, that there are other staff members besides people labeled faculty that can contribute in certain areas. So that's another thing to really promote ourselves effectively to be involved in things that we know we can contribute to. And RIT is just such a unique place. Um, how do you think that campus, greater campus culture affects library culture? Well, I think you know, and people say this all the time, RIT is a little different. Um, and I think part of it, um, I just attended the the administrator from Mishi's presentation that was one today. And he mentioned that that's something that's unusual about RIT because initially you think, okay, it's a tech school, is that they had these arts and humanities present, which is very different. So it adds this different spin on things. So we do have this combination of um, 
a number of students who are more on the geek side, you know, like engineers, computer scientists, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, then we have uh, the snappy dressers who are in business. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, liberal arts, which is like almost anything in the kitchen sink over there as far as all the programs and things that are taught. And then you have the art people who are very focused on creating and they are usually very unique individuals also. And just mixing them all together, plus adding um, the NTID student community to that, it's a very unique mixture of things. And in many ways, we're a lot more informal than a lot of university libraries. And part of that is that that's the best way to fit in with all these different types of students. They don't need an authority figure with rules um, that come across as not being approachable. We're here to work with the students and then the faculty um, to help them do the best they can educationally and also we're one of the more popular places to work. We have the most student employees after food service and most students tend to stay here the whole time they're at RIT as far as employing because not only in some cases they're using skills or learning skills that they can use in their career but they also um, use good work ethics, good habits, learn okay even though yeah, this is not your dream job, it's not a real job as far as what you get out once you're done with your education but yet kind of okay here's how you're a professional in any setting because those skills will be the same no matter what you do. And also many of them feel like it's in a way kind of a second home whether they're comfortable with the staff or sometimes the cohort of student workers that work together feel very comfortable and sometimes friendships come out of that but the idea is to make sure nobody feels odd in asking for help or scared to ask for help. There's no dumb questions even though maybe privately we'll roll our eyes <laughs> usually that might be with people who aren't students but um, and we're casual here and when I first came in here uh, okay all the women wore high heels dresses most of the time jewelry you know suits all that good stuff and over the years it's just become more casual you still want to look clean and stuff but uh, you'll find if you see all the staff it varies as far as what's there but that the staff here kind of reflect the student body here in many ways. Um, so it's really a good fit for a lot of people who work here in the library, um, more so than maybe at some of our neighbors um, here in Rochester. So we're coming up on the hour mark. Just want to check really quick and see how folks are feeling. I'm okay. Okay. Um, there are a few, a quick question I'd like to touch on. Um, so you're retiring this summer. Mm -hmm. Do you have any plans or goals that you would like to accomplish once you've retired? Well my first goal is not to be responsible for much of anything for a while. Um, probably the only thing I have planned um, and I'm not sure about this first one, it's my high school class 50th anniversary in early September. I have to decide if I'm going or not. Okay. And then the third week of September, my husband and I are planning a trip uh, to Washington, D.C. as a tourist, but we're going with a road scholar group, um, which provides small group experiences on a certain place or topic or whatever. And so um, we signed up just to see what that's like and we thought that would be an easy way to experience that type of group situation. And of course they're very interested in making sure you know or be prepared to enjoy a more historical type of tour. So we have three books we have to read <laughs> for the tour on Washington DC. Um, but other than that, um, I just want to, well, i got to do a lot of things at home that I've been putting off for years. Um, and then just 
I think the main thing is figuring out what will get me out of the house on a regular basis. Because now I see people all the time, I'm busy here, and so once the weekend hits, I'm happy to stay home by myself. And so that has to be flipped. So I have to make a point, okay, what am I going to do um, just so I'm not at home all the time and not doing much. And then one of my neighbors wants me to get a dog mm -hmm. because he has a dog and the people on the other side have two dogs. And his dream is to have electric fence all around the three houses so the dogs can have a big place to run around. And I'm like, well, not going to happen right away. <laughs> So really, I don't have a whole lot of plans. <laughs> That's okay. The Washington, D.C. trip does sound very fun, though. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. So we have one more session on the books, but Marcia, is there anything else that we didn't talk about today that you wanted to talk about? Well, the only thing, you know, I'd like to mention is that um, the best resource here of this library for the almost 40 years I've been here has always been the library staff. Um, except for that little bit when I first came about the upstairs, downstairs with the reference folks. Um, it's been a can-do culture, a service-oriented culture, but yet uh, a creative and innovative culture. And eventually, you know, has become a place where everybody is happy to work with each other to either solve a problem or do something new. And that's when I have new people come in to interview and I always meet with everybody. Um, I emphasize this and say this is a place where you have the opportunity to do more than just what's in your job description. Once you learn what you're supposed to be doing per your job description, you have all these other opportunities. And so I think that makes it another place where most of the time people want to stay for a while. So I just want to emphasize that, that uh, the head librarian can do a lot of things, you know, for the library, um, but it's really the staff that really is what makes it succeed. That's a really good note to end on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. We'll see oh, you sure. one more time. And with that, I'm going to stop.